Dear participants, welcome to the fourth session of Tech Week. Thank you for joining us on this webinar with the team behind the scenes inside the S100 technicalities. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Alexander Kramer and I am sales manager at Seven Seas. I was studying industrial engineering here in Hamburg. I worked for a tugboat company for nine years and recently switched to Seven Seas. Our main expert today is Holger Bottin, our S100 guru. He graduated as a navigation officer and is for almost 25 years at Seven Seas. Most of the time as a software developer for EC2007 kernel, ENC designer and Nautilus. His current position is product manager for the Nautilus SDK. Since 1996, he is involved in the standardization of hydrographic data, S57, S100, and expert for data modeling, coordinate reference systems, ISO, 8211 encapsulation. Our second expert is Friedhelm Mogat Kegeler. Friedhelm's educational background is uh, geodesy hydrography and he holds a degree in both fields. He joined Seven Seas in 2000 and ever since he has worked in various different positions. His long list of activities ranges from S57 data production and training, customer support, research and development um, to product management. Today, his activities focus on the development of product strategies and solutions. Freedom has long-term experience and specialized knowledge and expertise in the domain of electronic chart production and has expert knowledge about relevant IHO standards. He regularly represents our company at IHO working groups, meetings, industry conferences, and exhibitions. This webinar will be recorded and later offered on our YouTube channel. Questions can be addressed during the session in the questions section. Some of them will be answered at the end of the webinar. Remaining questions will be handled after the session by email. So enjoy the webinar and drink a digital coffee. So hello, good afternoon. This is Holger Boutin speaking. I hope you make yourself comfortable around our campfire and we will start our uh, presentation uh, and webinar. But before I go to the inside of S100, we would like to ask you something. And we have for that uh, prepared a little poll uh, and this will be done by Alex. So I give the microphone back to Alex uh, uh, and he will present the poll to you. So, okay, here comes the poll. How do you intend to use S100? Data production, application development, scientific research, other or not at all? So please answer it so we can have a feeling about our participants. So, yeah, please uh, vote. We have some answers yet, but at the moment, we have a, uh, at 73%. So uh, more to come. We have at the moment 27% data production and 73 application development. So yeah, let's see and continue. I will give back to Holger. OK. <clears throat> so let's looking behind the scenes of S100. What we will do today. First, also as a recall of the yesterday uh, uh, presentation, we talk a little bit about the IHO Geospatial Infrastructure Registry again. So <clears throat> a little bit more from a technical point of view. So the question in the beginning is, what is a register and how, how what is a registry? and how it is different from a register. You see how easy it is to mix these two words, but they have different meaning. And uh, <clears throat> registry actually means it is the information system that hosts the registers, or with other word, this are the technical infrastructure, the computer. Uh, and a register, its uh, shortest definition is a managed list. Pretty short. <clears throat> this list 
has the nature, this element which can are put to that list cannot be deleted, but they can be retired or superseded. So they have a status, each element has a status, and the status is a, a subject of changing, but nothing can be removed from that list. What's once is in a register, it will stay there forever. That's very important uh, uh, property. So that means if something is referencing an element in a register, that link will never point to some empty space. So that will never be a broken link. It might at some point in time refers to a retired uh, element, but this is still a valid thing. Okay, <clears throat> you see the uh, address actually of the, red, uh, of the IHO registry. So uh, if you like, you can go there and look how it's, uh, what's inside. Uh, <clears throat> and then you will see that we have actually four types of registers there. One is called the feature concept dictionary, which contains feature types and information types. And we will see a little bit more on this details uh, on one of the next slides. Then we have the portrayal register. There are also symbols registered, also colors, line styles, fill patterns, all the basic things to do uh, the depiction of graph of, of data products. Uh, then we have a register for product specifications. So that means if someone create a product specification, bind all the things together, then the whole product specification do, goes to a register. <clears throat> and last but not least, we have a register there on agency code. Agency codes are the codes for the data or is assigned to data producers. So whoever is uh, uh, creating data in this context, he needs this registered as an agency code so that's in the metadata, we can find out who is actually the originator of that particular data set. So a little bit more on the feature concept dictionary, as I promised. <clears throat> Four different types of these elements we have in the register. And these elements, element types are feature types, information types, simple and complex attributes, and enumerated values uh, for attributes. I will explain everything a little bit more. Feature types, by definition, are an abstract view or abstract abstraction of the uh, real world phenomena. So that means something what exists in the real world, it has not to be physical, physically exists. It can be also some virtual thing. Uh, can be, we can have an abstraction for that in our, in our register here. <clears throat> this is a so-called model view to the reality. So for instance, we have a, <clears throat> Uh, a feature type like a cardinal buoy or lateral buoy. So these things exist in reality. Our view to that is from a certain domain perspe perspective. Uh, so we don't want to know all uh, properties uh, which this object in real world has. We only are interested in a specific view of this thing especially also the definition comes from a specific view. Uh, information types. This is something new in S100 and I call it shareable pieces of information. So little objects uh, similar to feature types, but they cannot have a location somewhere on the earth. So, but they can be shared uh, between other objects and they are there to provide additional information to other objects. We will see also in another example a little bit later what it is. Attributes, these are the properties of both feature types and information types. And they can be simple or complex. Simple attributes, uh, these are attributes which have just one value. 
So this is something you might know from the S57 uh, uh, standard from, from the uh, way, because all the attributes we have there are simple attributes. Com complex attributes uh, are structures of other attributes. So a complex attribute consists of other attributes, which can be complex again. Uh, and with this, uh, we can build hierarchies. Enumerated values, this is something special, which we have uh, for attributes here. So we have one of our simple attributes is called an enumeration attribute. The value it can store is a number, but for each of those attributes, the number has a different meaning. For example, if we have the attribute color, the value one means black and the value two means white, the value three means red and so forth. For other attributes uh, we have, which are also enumerated, the value one and two and three will have a complete different meaning. This enumerated values are defining the domain of values which can be uh, presented by one of those attributes. So where we have another uh, distinction <clears throat> here uh, in the feature concept dictionary because we not only divide it by these different types, we divide it also by different domains. And this, the reason is that we have different communities uh, which dealing with these domains and <clears throat> they will then maintain this sub-register uh, because they have the domain knowledge. So examples for those domains are the IHO hydrographic domain, which contains all the items which we fi will find in, for instance, uh, electronic uh, uh, nautical charts, ENCs, but we have also the inland ENC uh, domain, which is more specialized in elements which we find in the data for inland waterways. And then there's also the, as one, another example, the World Meteorological Organization, which has uh, special expertise, uh, as everyone expect, uh, with for the weather or the, how to modeling uh, weather information. I saw that uh, my co-expert, Friedhelm, uh, raised a hand, which probably means that he has a question. So I hand over to Friedhelm. Yes, thank you, Holger. Sorry for interrupting you. Yeah, and it's very nice to uh, consider me to be the co-expert today. But still, I have a question. Uh, maybe a co-expert should um, also have the answer. No, the, the question is referring to the the registers uh, you just explained. I always have to pay attention not to mix it up. So there's a register for feature types, and there's also a register for attributes. So I always look at it from the perspective of, for example, an ENC product. So I know a feature type in an ENC product would be, for example, a lateral buoy, right? And uh, an, an attribute could be the color. So, but now the feature type and the attributes are listed here in separate registers. Does it mean that the feature type register doesn't have any attributes? Indeed, uh, in the concept dictionary, we have this as separate items, the so-called building blocks. When we will see uh, on one of the next slide how this comes together, uh, and then we're talking about the feature catalog. That uh, is a, some product-specific information that a feature, of course, has attributes, but it has attributes in the context of a certain product. A different product might have completely different uh, requirements for the attributes. Yeah, I think the, for navigation, uh, it's important that the buoy has a color and a shape and something. But another uh, <clears throat> for another product, maybe the uh, maintenance of uh, nav aids product, whatever, uh, uh, they also need to know the weight of those uh, buoy because they have to lift them on a the ship. 
or they have to know the price because they have to buy some. Uh, those, in, those information are not necessary for navigation and that's why we do not bind them, these attributes here on the concept dictionary, so we leave them um, uh, separate. And we will see in, uh, in the next slide, uh, probably, yes, uh, <clears throat> Uh, how this comes to uh, uh, to the feature catalog is probably in the in, in, in the slide after this. So we have to first uh, ask the question: What's the content of the feature concept dictionary? And as the name dictionary uh, assumed uh, is the most important content of a dictionary is the definition. You can say dictionaries are there to giving definitions. To, to items and uh, there are other informations of course because everything which is in a register needs a name, needs a code, there might be aliases, uh, so different names which are used for the same thing and there are also informations about references so that means where comes the definition from because not everything is invented here, there are long uh, <clears throat> long time use definitions somewhere in a IHO dictionary or even in the Oxford dictionary or wherever you find definition of things. Uh, then there's also management information so for each element in a register we can have an information uh, when it is put in, uh, who was the submitter and uh, or if it's superseded it's what is the item what is this, uh, which supersedes it and, uh, and those information. <clears throat> as least as interesting what is the content or what is yeah inside this concept dictionary is the question what is not in the uh, concept dictionary and this brings uh, us back to uh, free times question they say bindings. Bindings will not be on the level of the feature concept dictionary. Bindings, for instance, one example for bindings, the most <clears throat> yeah, well-known uh, uh, example is the attribute binding. So that means which attributes will be used for uh, a certain feature type. And this task is then done by the feature catalog. We have one exception here and we, if you remembered our four types uh, in the feature content dictionary, we had that enumerated values and enumerated values are always on this level even bound to one attribute and not too many. So we cannot share the value red between uh, different attributes. So this is always a direct member, so to speak, to the uh, attribute color. And this, that's why we have uh, an implicit binding here for for this type of uh, register item. Having said all this, uh, then <clears throat> there is a list of recommended app attributes for feature types. So even if they're not bound to that feature type, in the dictionary you find a recommended list which can be used or which might be useful for the certain feature type. That will help the producer of a feature catalog to choose the appropriate attributes in his product for this uh, feature type. So because if you just don't have that information then you pick up a feature type and then you have a bunch of 150, 200 attributes there and it might be very difficult to uh, find the one which is uh, appropriate for this. So this recommend, recommended list will help you to build up a feature catalog. So how the feature catalog is built is shown in, on, on this next uh, slide here. So we have the feature concept dictionary which contains the building blocks and then we take some software called the Feature Catalog Builder. It can be something which is, exists as an online resource, uh, but it can be also a, just a text editor or an XML editor, uh, whatever software that is. And then we 
bind the things together. So we take the building blocks which we need for our product, bind them together to create some nice structure and create a feature catalog. <clears throat> so, question was why we need the feature concept dictionary. And again, it contains the building blocks for creating the feature catalog. And what is the feature catalog? To answer that question, I looked up for definition and I found uh, this definition as a feature catalog in the context we are interesting here. And this is the context for geographic information. And this ISO TC211 means the Technical Committee 211 from the International Standard Organization. This dealing with geo standards on geographic information. And on this standards, we built S100. So S100 is a profile of the standards done by this technical committee. And we took also the vocabulary from this standards into our standard here. Uh, and in this context, the feature catalog refers to a description of an abstraction of reality that might be used to depict one or more geographic data set. That's really an abstract uh, <clears throat> definition, but it's quite often the nature of definitions. So what is it good for? That would be uh, the next question here. And <clears throat> I think the feature catalog, uh, we can define it in a way that it describes which information can be presented in a geographic data set. So it gives all the types of, uh, of features we can have in, in that uh, geographic data set with all the properties, attributes it can have, relationships to other objects and so on. All this kind of uh, structure we can define by the feature catalog. Sometimes you will see in, in, in an ISO standard, this is also referred uh, as an application schema, which is just an alias for the same thing. And this is the model of our feature catalog in S100. And don't worry, we don't go to all the details here. I just want to show you, if you are <clears throat> looking to the details or searching for the details in the standard, you might find a lot of them. And we will only have a view on some of these details. So first of all, the feature catalog is part of the specification for a specific product, so for product specifications, even the to me, at least, it's the most important part of a product specification because products, the feature catalog defines what is the content of that product. Without this, no product. So it is an absolute necessary uh, part of a product, of a data product. <clears throat> it is a machine readable, readable resources. So uh, in S100, we have a, a schema which is provided with a standard and the uh, feature catalog for each product must follow that schema, which is good because software can then make a validation on, on each feature catalog and can find that this is conforming to the standard. Standard conformance is, when it comes to implementation, a very important uh, topic. If you find in uh, some resources that are not standard conformant, then it is always difficult to uh, for the software to, to guess what actually the information should be. <clears throat> Elements of the feature catalog, and now we get some good friends from our dictionary back here, are feature types, information types, attributes, again, simple or complex, and we have also feature association and information associations here. A little bit more to that. Feature associations describing the relationship between one feature type and another feature type. For instance, we have a cardinal buoy, which in reality marks some kind of obstruction or wreck. Then we could, on this data level, we could put an association between these two uh, objects or instances of, of, uh, uh, of these feature types. The information association, on the other hand, gives the relationship from any object to the information type which 
carries additional information that are associated to this object. We also find in the feature catalog roles. Roles describe the reason why we have that relation. So <clears throat> if you are known to modeling a little bit, then you know that the uh, between two instances, the association is a kind of connection and the roles are the end of that connections. And last but not least, uh, the feature catalog binds things together. So it contains the binding. And one, uh, one example is the attribute binding. So it tells you which attribute can be used for a specific feature type. And that's we will also, to that we will also look a little bit more in detail here. So it, the attribute binding in the feature catalog defines which attribute can be used, but it provides also some additional information. One of them is the multiplicity. Sometimes you read also the term cardinality. That's again uh, means exactly the same. And it tells you how often this attribute can be used on that feature type. And examples I give here uh, on this slide is uh, zero to one. That means the attribute can be there but must, must not be there with other words is optional if the cardinality is one then there's no excuse it must be there it's a mandatory attribute so without this attribute the actual data set would be not conform to the product specification and then the last example here zero to many the little asterisk means many uh, that means that the attribute is optional but it can also be repeated so there can be more than one attribute of this type on this feature type. In addition to the multiplicity we have a sequential flag on that uh, attribute binding and that uh, describes if the attribute appears more than once uh, if that the order actually in the data set has some meaning. <clears throat> As an example if we have a cardinal buoy, which has the color black, yellow, and black. So we will have the color attribute uh, three times, but the order of these three attributes is meaningful because if we don't give the order, then it might be black, black, and yellow. So to see actually what the pattern looks like, we need to order this and this flag just gives you the indication uh, if the order has some meaning or not. <clears throat> and we will have or we can have a list of permitted values uh, on the attribute binding level. That means if we have an enumerated attribute, uh, we can restrict the domain of this attribute to a subset of what's actually defined in the feature concept dictionary and have only the values allowed here that make some sense. Example is we have a light feature, so a navigational light uh, that will have a color, but not all the colors will be used for light features. For instance, black makes no sense at all and other colors which might be in the color attribute are even not used for navigational lights. So we can restrict on the product level uh, the, <clears throat> the, the values which, may, which might be useful or it might be uh, uh, allowed or not. So this is uh, the attribute binding. So now you have an idea to what detail a feature catalog defines the, uh, the content of a data set. But then the next que question which comes up is, where are all this coming from? So <clears throat> why we have this structure in the feature catalog? And the answer is, it comes from the general feature model of S100. This really is the base of every model 
everything in that standard. This is really the, <clears throat> the source of everything here. It is a profile of a model described in one of the ISO standards and shows in a generic way how the geographic data is internally organized. And this is the model. You see, it's a little bit less complicated than the feature catalog model, but still it's a lot of lines and boxes. Uh, but we will only have a look to a few of them, to feature types, information types, the feature association, information association. Yeah, you, you heard these terms before. Uh, but then we have thematic attributes and spatial attributes, but you not have directly heard about because they are slightly different named here, but I give you the definition of those in the next slides. <clears throat> Feature types, as I said also before, are the abstracts of real world phenomena. They may have thematic attributes, that's what I have called attributes before. That means the properties like colors, shapes, uh, whatever uh, you can uh, imagine on, on, a, on a property of an object, the depth of a depth area, all the things. Uh, and, but they also might have, may have spatial attributes. Spatial attributes in this context means this is they defining what, where is the object located on the surface of the earth or with other words what is the geometry of that feature type there are feature types which have no geometry but they have then associations to other feature types so that's the next point feature types may have associations to other feature types and on top of that they may have association to information types information types as i said a shareable piece of information where the thematic attributes, they cannot be shared between feature types. If I have one feature which has a color red and another one which has also the color red, then this is this two attribute red are completely uh, different from it. They don't know from each other. It's a different instances of this attribute. They live in this feature type, but the information type is a shareable piece. An example might be, we have a note, let's say a legal note, which applies to all of the NAF aids in a certain area. Then all the feature types, which uh, describing uh, aids to navigation, like a, a buoy or a beacon, they have an information association to that information type of, of type legal note, and so the actual text, this legal text, which might be lengthy, it's only once in a data set and has not to be repeated on every feature type. This is, in terms of maintenance, a big uh, a step forward against our old uh, S57 data model, where those information has to be repeated on each feature. And when it comes to updating, though, some text changes in that you have to update it, uh, uh, a dozen or hundreds of of objects and now you have to update only one object so <clears throat> information types itself can have thematic attributes and they may have association to other information types this allows the data modeler to create hierarchies of information types. Feature associations describing the relationship between feature types and information association, they describe the relationship between an information type and any other object. And they might also have, both of this uh, association might have also attributes itself. So the relationship also can have properties. So you can have a real rich model uh, on each level of, uh, of this associations. Then we have the semantic attributes. <clears throat> they describing the properties of objects. And 
again, we have the simple attributes which carry values like text or numbers, uh, a date or time. Uh, and we have complex attributes which combine other attributes to build up hierarchies. And last but not least, we have the spatial attributes because we have geographic data. That means this geographic, most of these geographic objects, they have some location on the uh, on the surface of this planet. And to describe that, we need uh, this spatial attributes, which actually gives us the position and the shape of uh, a feature type. All the location is defined by subclasses of this GM object here, which is the base class in another model, which is uh, the spatial model. And we will not go into detail on this uh, model uh, during the session today. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I saw that my co-expert again is raising his hand and I give it over, I give the microphone over to Freetime. Uh, yes, sorry, Holger, for bugging you again. Um, I was just thinking, um, you say all the slides reads that spatial attributes um, describe the spatial characteristics of a feature type. So they contain the information if it's represented by a curve or a surface or a point. Do these spatial attributes also have uh, contain the coordinates or how are the coordinates represented in this model? Yes, this special objects, uh, points, curves, and, and, and surfaces, they contain the coordinates. Actually, uh, points have coordinates, curves have coordinates, surfaces do not have coordinates itself because surfaces are bound by curves and the coordinates come from the curves. So you force me even to, to do a little bit more explanation on the spatial uh, model now, There are also curves. Not all the curves have coordinate itself because we have also, there are some kind of composite curves. So we can make curves which consists of other curves. But the lowest level of curve, they have the coordinates which are stored in segments, which are parts of the curves. So this is the details on the spatial model. And if someone is more interested in how this is done, he can join in tomorrow and learn a little bit more on this model. Okay, well, let's see what's on the next slide. Ah, yeah, we want to make a little roundup on what we learned on data models. <clears throat> First, we have the, as I said, the base of everything. It's the general feature model. So the general feature model, for instance, describes the concept of a feature type. This is very, very abstract. Then we come to the feature catalog and the feature catalog makes specializations of that abstract concept of a feature type and makes uh, non-abstract feature types like a little lateral buoy, which is, has already some real world meaning. Then we come to a data set and the data set contains not types, the data set contains objects. Objects are instances of types. So, and this data set may have a lateral buoy object uh, inside, which has an attribute name with the value of 18 and the color of red. And this is still the abstract of a real world phenomena because this is, has a reference to something which should exist in the real world. And this might be this uh, red buoy where the name is 18. So this is how model work from a general feature model to uh, specialization, instantiation, and then a, a reference to the real world. This is a roundup how geographic information works. Having said this, we're coming now for something completely different. Now we know how geographic data is structured. But we all 
<clears throat> also make some use of this data. Of course, we can just query this data and can get the information out and do some calculations, whatever we want. But one of the main tasks for geographic data is just to present them in form of a map. So in S100, this is called portrayal. And the general purpose or general process uh, for this portrayal looks the same for all the data products. And it goes like this. We have data which we want to portray. Then we have two things. We have rules and we have a software which is called portrayal engine. And the portrayal engine software will take the rules and the data and create drawing instructions. Drawing instructions is still uh, something what you can't see. It's still some abstract information, but it gives you <clears throat> it's a list of things we want to present, like a instruction, we want to draw a symbol for a certain object or at a certain position, depends on the implementation. And or we want to draw a line with this, uh, uh, with a line style or all those kind of instructions. So they can be sorted, as it's a list, so lists can be sorted. And then uh, the next piece of software in that uh, process will be the rendering engine. The rendering engine uh, takes the drawing instruction and it has also access to this little database below uh, which contains symbols, symbol definitions or other graphic primitives for which will be used for depiction like colors, line styles, fill patterns, all those things. And what the rendering engine actually outputs is the portrayal output. That might be the image of the map. And this is the generic uh, process and that's all the, the same uh, for all the portrayal. And the two things on the bottom, you see, the rules and the symbols, these are <clears throat> combined together in what we call the portrayal catalog. And the portrayal, the portrayal catalog is a resource which is 100% machine readable. So that means we can change the portrayal for a certain product just by changing this catalog in the end system. We have not to touch the system itself, especially we have not to change the software. This is a really big step forward uh, because in the past, this was a maintenance nightmare for system manufacturers. If even a small change due to the, present, to the presentation library forces them to make software updates to all system which were around the world on on uh, on ships. So this is part of the plug and play concept of S100. It's not the only part, but it's I say one of the most important parts. <clears throat> and the input and the output to the portrayal engine is standardized. So we have a standardized data model. Also the output, this means this display instruction, they are modeled in the uh, S100 standard. So we will find in the portrayal section, a model of all this uh, instruction. So since both ends of the software is standardized, the implementation of the software itself, it depends on the um, manufacturer. So they can do whatever they do, as long as they take the standardized input and convert it into the uh, also standardized output. <clears throat> what is defined by the standard as well is the methods that can be used for the rules. And we have actually uh, two uh, of those uh, languages which can be used for this machine readable use, uh, rules, sorry. And the one is the called the XSLT, it's a transformation uh, language which comes from the XML world, originally was uh, defined for uh, 
transforming one XML into another or transforming XML to HTML. Um, these are the, uh, the original use, but it is a generic uh, transformation language and, uh, and it can be used for any kind of transformation almost. And the other uh, uh, way of doing it is a scripting language and this is called Lua. It's not so widely known in, in, uh, in the world, but it has some nice features. For instance, it has a very small footprint. It has a very good performance and it's widely used in the gaming industry. So that means performance seems to be also uh, <clears throat> not too bad. The last thing I want to talk about today is then all these elements should come together in the product specification. So <clears throat> at the end, we would have, we want to have data and the data must belong to a product, to a data product. And the product specification defines how this data should look. It defines the feature can look, which means this is the structure of that data the logical structure, not the physical structure. Then we will have the portrayal catalog. That means this is the way of how this data should be depicted in uh, any kind of system. If the, port, uh, if the product is a subject of portrayal, there might be data which are no subject of portrayal, but most of our geographic data will be also have a, a, a need for presentation. The encoding is also part, is quite an important part for product specification because if the data producer starts to create data, then each data producer should encode real world phenomena in the same way. If they not getting some guidance on this they will do it in different ways and we have that we had that experience in the past so that's why the encoding uh, guide for product is quite important otherwise the end user of the data will be confused why the same thing is here uh, modeled in this way and uh, in another data set from another producer it is something completely different and uh, but in the nature it looks exactly the same so that will <clears throat> just raise confusion and that's why it's important to describe the encoding. Then the encapsulation, it's of course also very important. This describes the physical structure, the bits and bytes, the data format to speak. And uh, there we can the, uh, define, the one who defines a product can choose from different uh, encapsulation methods. So we have here in, in this slide, we're showing GML, it's an XML flavor for geographic data. And we have the ISO 8211 uh, uh, encoding. This is uh, might be known because this was already used for S57. We have another encoding, which is not on the slide here. And this is for gridded data. And, uh, and this is called HDF5. So there's a, three sections in S100. Each section describes how this encoding has to be used then the product specification should have a uh, description of the provision of data, so how the exchange set is structured. Also, if the product is a subject of update, if, if it's a, a subject of updating, then there should be a description how this updating works, the schema for this updating. And last but not least, uh, we will have the <clears throat> security scheme for, for data product. This might, uh, contain measures for data protection, so copy protection of data, or in other words, the encryption of data. And even more important, at least to me, is the data authentication, so that the receiver of a data set can prove, or the system can prove, that the data actually comes from the source uh, which he expect and this nobody was had his hand on this data and uh, <clears throat> yeah and modify them or remove elements from that data and that's the end of my presentation and uh, so I give over to the moderator now and you will see already we have some questions to answer
So over to Alex. Thank you, Holger, for the presentation. I think uh, all our attendants are very interested in um, that theme and um, we quite received some questions and um, I think we'll um, give to um, Friedhelm um, to um, read the first question. So Friedhelm, here you are. Yes, indeed, we received quite a few questions. Um, there's one interesting question um, related to the portrayal catalog. Um, the question is if it uh, will be distributed with, uh, alongside uh, with, with the data and uh, what happens if um, the catalog um, or the portrayal rules change or if they get updated, what would be the impact on the type approval? And I guess uh, this refers to the type approval of Actis. And um, an example is given what happens if a new portrayal catalog um, has an impact on the performance of the portrayal engine. Um, the question is very good. Um, as always, the answer is not that easy because uh, when we talk about Actis type approval, and that's what I guess this question is referring to, um, we always talk about the Actis performance standard. And um, currently, Actors Performance Standards are not uh, really referring to the new IHO standards yet. So these are still processes and uh, that need to be implemented. And uh, IHO and IMO are in or working groups of, of both bodies are in close cooperation. So this needs to be clarified during the uh, process of uh, rewriting or updating the Actors Performance Standards. I hope this um, yeah, was a comprehensive answer. As um, we always do, we will um, publish all the questions uh, as a follow-up to this uh, session and um, distribute all questions and answers, uh, also those that cannot be answered um, today. Um, Holger, is there another question you picked up? Yes, uh, I do. There's a question uh, that, say, in S57, the feature catalog could build with personalized, unique attribute specifically used in this organization. And uh, from the presentation, uh, <clears throat> it seems to be that in S100, the feature catalog is limited to only attributes and definition, uh, which comes from the feature concept dictionary. This... Uh, might be my fault to and for the sake of simplicity i uh, uh <clears throat> i limit it to this but this is actually not true so it's still possible that the feature catalog can have elements which are not defined in the feature concept dictionary also then this kind of information are not shareable with other people with other communities so it might be also worse to think about to define this element first in the in a register in a domain specific register and then uh, use them but it's also used it's also possible to use private feature types and private attributes uh, in a feature catalog so this uh, is not gone but uh, as i said uh, then this information will not be shareable to others but maybe this is the intention so uh it was probably my fault uh, sorry for that that i have not explained that correctly in uh in my presentation so another question i see here is uh that each product specification contains security scheme uh that this is implying there's different products using different schemes and it is likely to be a case in practice it would be the benefits of this approach. Uh, also, uh, mea culpa, so it's, <laughs> I have to uh, <clears throat> confess this, I was not very precise here. Actually, the feature, uh, the product specification defines only if you want to, if the product will use this kind of security scheme. The building blocks for that, the algorithms, the formats which should be used when it is used is defined in a new part in S57 edition 4. There will be a new part and this will replace the old S63 
standard. So all the algorithms and formats, uh, they will be described in S100, so that all S100 based product will use the same formats and algorithms, but not all of the products, for instance, will use uh, encryption. That might be only applying to some of the products. Authentication is a different topic that should be used by any product now because we have some requests, for instance, from the International Maritime Organization that there should be no file coming to an onboard system which has no, uh, has not proving is authentication by, for instance, a method like a signal, digital signature. And how digital signatures are done, again, are described in the uh, S100 standard. So I hope this brings a little bit more clearness into that topic. Sorry for being, again, not very <laughs> correct in my presentation. And I see that Freetime has picked up uh, uh, an, another question. Yes, I can see that there is a, a follow-up uh, on the organization-specific definitions. And um, the question is um, how these organization-specific definitions, um, how they make their way to the uh, uh, register. Um, I would, would leave this answer to Holger, but I have a comment on this. I guess if these are, Holger indicated it, if these are organization-specific definitions, uh, what I know is that some producers use these organization-specific definitions in the process of the data production. Um, once the data is distributed, these organization-specific definitions do not uh, are not included um, anymore, and um, the reason is because they could not be interpreted, for example, by the target system, for example, the ECTIS or ECS systems. So, I the, my question would be: Is it would it be um, required to register organization-specific definitions if they have a temporary character only, or would this be something to the production system which would allow the individual organization to handle specific definitions as long as they don't intend to distribute these to the public? Is that, uh, could you answer this, Holger? I... Yes, I can uh, try to answer. So the feature catalog model allows to contains even definitions. So it means if, if the definition doesn't come from any register, then it can be defined directly in the feature catalogs. It can be even defined somewhere else. And then we have a reference from uh, the feature catalog to this other resource. So it must not come really from a register. Uh, and But the question was about how to submit this or how to yeah submit this uh, uh, definitions to an existing register and i can maybe tell a little bit more on that if there is a domain specific register where this information would fit in so that for this kind of domain actually one exists then a proposal can be made so the uh, the proposer must be in the list of submitting organizations the register itself will be managed by a register manager. He's the responsible person for uh, making this. But the decision uh, if a proposal actually will go into that register is then made by a group of experts, and that's called the domain control body. So this is a little bit more complex because what happens if they say no? We don't like this definition, so uh, and then there's also a kind of appealing process and can go backward and forward. That's all described in another IHO publication, and this is the uh, special publication S99. This describes the process of submitting elements to the registers, and which is... Uh, which 
way it's used if it registers in a register or defining direct uh, private things in the feature catalog that's up to the data or the creator of the data of the product specification okay i think uh, i give over to alex because we unfortunately uh, reached the end of our session today um, <clears throat> yeah but we will be back tomorrow and the last words uh, has our moderator alex okay yes thank you for listening um wish you a nice morning noon afternoon or evening from stormy hamburg um and um i hope you enjoyed uh, this session and uh yeah have a nice evening bye